Fishing News is sponsored by these fine partners. Of option two as the motion on the table right now, so you have to dispense with first. I, I I thought I was leading into that, Jeff. I'm sorry. Um, so um, what I'm supposed to. Uh, I think this then goes back to Dick as chair of the council because it, it's out of my committee now. All the vote. All the vote. All the vote. Go ahead, Pat. Just keep do it. Dick might have lost his connection again. Call the vote. Call the vote. Can't call the vote. Lost the chairman for the umpteenth time. As I editorialized recently in the Fisherman Magazine, virtual nonsense, yet another technologically flawed go-to webinar presented by the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife and their parent, the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm Jim Hutchinson with a New Jersey Delaware Bay edition of the Fisherman Magazine. Today's date is April 14th, 2022, and that meeting of the New Jersey Marine Fisheries Council last Thursday went on for four long hours. In dog years, every year of a mutt's life equals seven human years, so every four hours of a fisheries meeting figure 12 times that. In theory, I'm just two days closer to death after that meeting. The chairman was bounced from the meeting several times last Thursday. I had several people texting me, calling me, emailing me uh, who could not get in to register a vote. But those that did, by my account, I sat there, watched that meeting, and kept pencil notations. And the members of the public that did vote, I kept tally, was two to one in favor of the slot option for summer flounder or fluke as opposed to option number one, which was the preferred option, that was a second favorite option, three at 17 and a half inches. Final tally, what we can expect on fluke sea bass and porgy in New Jersey. I say final tally because this still has to become, uh, well, it's gotta get signed off on, I guess, by the DEP commissioner himself. But what we can expect, fluke opens May 2nd, a three fish bag, two of those fish from 17 to 17.99 inches, one 18 inches or above. You get that same variance at Island Beach as before, two at 16. And of course, it's three at 17 west of the coal regs on Delaware Bay. Sea bass will get underway on May 17th. A 10 fish bag, 13 inch size limit. Porgy goes from nine inches to 10 inches, no closed season and a 50 fish bag. About eight minutes from now, we'll talk more about what went down at the council, how this vote tr transpired, and of course, more of my undying affection for Governor Phil Murphy. But before going down that rabbit hole, let's first pick up where we left off last week with big striped bass here in the Garden State. Now, after the video forecast was done last Thursday, that morning, uh, if you saw the Fisherman's Facebook page around noon, I had found a bigger photo of a bigger fish online that arrived at my desk that morning. It's as impressive, well, the video is as impressive as the fish itself. Ryan Anderson was fishing with Mandel Mobley somewhere along the Delaware River last week. When I saw the photo posted, I got in touch with both Ryan and Mandel. It was caught on bloodworm and it was a monster. In fact, listening to the video, uh, if you can hear it, the crowd that gathered was duly impressed. Also, if you can focus your ears on that, Mandel capably handles this fish with care given the fact that she is loaded with eggs. But at one point, Ryan reaches down to help uh, and, and Mandel says, no, not there, not in the gill plate. So that's really cool. And then they lifted this fish uh, quickly to lay it down in the mud there. And they took a tape measure to this fish, 51 inches by 32 inches in girth. Add it up. Length times girth times girth divided by 800 is the formula. That fish weighs 65 pounds. Kudos to Mandel and crew for taking good care of this fish. Ryan cradling that egg-laden belly uh, before they pushed her off to swim and hopefully spawn uh, in the coming days. Mandel also told me that he and some other dedicated surf casters there on the Delaware, including Boopy Norman, uh, have really been doing well in recent days. And it looks like there is a good slug of spawning fish that have moved up the Delaware this season. Circle hooks and blood worms. That's been the ticket there. But I do dare say it may be time to switch over to circle hooks and clams if you can find them at this point. Black drum have arrived in the Great Bay area. 
Now, I'm sure they're in the Delaware Bay stretches as well. Of course, once we get into May and June, Delaware Bay is the drum time, right? But the first reports we seem to get of black drum every year seem to come uh, as uh, somewhere be behind Absecon Inlet or Beach Haven Inlet in that Great Bay area. Qual Wynn let me know on Tuesday his buddy Johnny picked up a pair of black drum early in the morning, Tuesday, the biggest going about 42 pounds. That was in the Great Bay area. I had another black drum report the week before at a ship bottom, Fisherman's Headquarters. Farmer Green here stumbled out of the corn row with a unique harvest. Actually, I think Greeny let that fish go. And Fishhead Greg altered the background to protect the spot. But let's be honest, the dogwoods are blooming, so the drum, they should be booming. I have not received any reports on bluefish or weakfish, not as of yet. But as a reminder, that fourth full moon of 2022, the aptly called pink moon, will come out on Saturday, April 16th. I'm betting that we're gonna enter a new stage of saltwater action after that full moon, maybe upon the full moon. Uh, my buddy tells me the terns and laughing gulls are already on the search for cinder worms along the local creeks. Now this is video that I shot in April of 2021 at the time of the full moon then. Cinder worms actively flitting along the surface. That photo is actually one of the stripers I took using a bobber as a popping cork around blitzing fish out back. A very unique fishery if you stumble into that, but again, look for that around the time of this full moon. You can find the article I wrote with some help from my friendly worm addicted neighbors by searching for cinder worm in the search bar on thefisherman.com. That's that little magnifying glass. It's a piece I wrote up for our June 2021 edition of the Fisherman Magazine about fishing around those cinder worms. Subscribers, of course, you get our weekly digital copies as well as the monthly. Uh, this week's cover on the digital is a photo you've probably seen before. It's the El Nino boys getting into some of the stripers on the Raritan Bay, vibing it, thanks to Nomad. Word from the northern part of the state this week is that new stripers are arriving every day. And yes, the boats are getting in on the action too, out of Manasquan and Shark River at this point. In his weekly report from the North Jersey region, over there at thefisherman.com, field editor J.B. Casper said, the captains and the tackle shops that he spoke to earlier this week and over the weekend said it didn't matter what you put in front of those striped bass, they whacked it from shorts up to 40 pounders bending rods. Anthony Tony, Ma Tony Maja Arcabasio said the Maja casting spoons are getting it done. I understand that the uh, reports of flutter spoons are solid by boat. Also the pluggers by boat, they're also mugging each other from shore. And the kayak guys are getting in on the action at this point as well. Kevin Ryan from Staten Island with a slot from his kayak on the Staten Island flats one ounce bullet head and a five and a half inch green shad from Tog Candy Jigs. Speaking of Tog Candy, Tracy Long caught a nice one, a Tog on the, on the rocks in Belmar over the week. The fish, Tracy said, was safely released back into Shark River. And our South Jersey field editor, Anthony Califano, reports this week the Tog are actively biting in South Jersey along the jetties and near the bridges, with some pushing the four pound mark. Of course, if you want the bigger specimens, head east. That's where Antonio Marcico went, just a little offshore out of Cape May, registering this whopper, a 15 and a half pound tog over the weekend. Get in on this bite while it's hot this month at the Jersey Shore through the end of, this, uh, through the end of April. And of course, those Delaware boats are sailing as well for tog out of Indian River Inlet and also out of Lewis. I'm thinking that by next week, after the full moon, we'll be getting some more of uh, some more reports, especially early reports on bluefish and weakfish. First out of Cape May and Atlanta counties, then perhaps those racer blues will make their bloody rush through the, the inlets. Think Shark River, Manasquan, and Barnegat as well. Again, typically around the time of the full moon. Last year was the third week in April, I believe. This week, of course, our April, uh, our April moon is this weekend. So I'm kind of anticipating that that's what's ahead of us in the near future. Now, last weekend, a good time was had by all out at Spring Lake for the opening day of trout season 
in the Garden State, the Shark River Surf Anglers hosting their 20th anniversary opening day youth fishing tournament. A smattering of rain didn't dampen spirits, nor did it wash out the action. A lot of good fish caught by some great young anglers. Though a little after 9 a.m., I heard a gasp from the crowd. Spectators made a hole for one young man named Ryan Carney, a 13-year-old in a Notre Dame t-shirt who looked as if he'd done serious hand-to-fin battle with this monster rainbow. The tournament-winning fish pinned the scale to nine pounds, 14 ounces, earning Ryan a chip on Saturday. The young fighting Irishman bloodied but proud of an amazing put-and-take fish. Yes, folks, some trout are stocked to be taken. Think uh, Tuckerton. Think Spring Lake. But I'll tell you what, this young man took an impressive fish out of Spring Lake on Saturday. In fact, one youngster standing next to me during the weigh-in said, boy, that looks like a salmon. It sure did. More on New Jersey fluke and sea bass in about two minutes. But first, let's get our freshwater rundown with my friend George the Pocono Outdoors guy. Well, hey, Jim, you know the forsythia is in bloom, and for many, that is the start and the ringing of the bell for the shad season. Yeah, I know we've had those big rains last week, but guys, this happens to us every year, and we manage to get through it. So let's get this rain out of the way. It looks like we're uh, looking forward to a little bit better weather. Temperatures are warming up. It's 70 degrees here right now, so things are looking up. That water will warm up and turn those shad on. So that's a good update there for our, our, our uh, shad watch. Uh, our good friend, Tim, Keebler has been out on the river testing the waters and coming up with some good shad. Now, while we're talking about Tim, I want to swing over to the trout season. Uh, here in PA, you know, the creeks have still been swollen. They're coming back down to good levels. Uh, Tim was up my way, uh, heading up north there, and also getting a couple of nice rainbows. Now, staying on trout and crossing the river, good friend Jen Wong, he was out uh, testing the waters of New Jersey for some trout. And that with uh, Timmy Lois Hill, uh, they both got into some really good trout trout putting a hurting on them in the garden state so keep up with that guys now i also want to talk about besides trout you know the lake levels are coming back down to normal we're starting to see a return of, of the striper bite turning back on a uh, good friend josh taylor was out working a jigging spoon in about 30 some feet of water and he managed to get into those schooly stripers probably 25 to 30 of them he said just on the spoon but the trick is you got to see them before you start dry, uh, jigging for them so be sure you get that sonar out look spot those schools and you can go ahead and jig on them now also uh, don't forget that the bass season you know we got pre-spawn bass out guys like our good friend Nick Canestra down there in the lower Susquehanna he's out throwing a red crankbait and getting on those pre-spawn bass pretty successfully now we don't know what it is but that red uh, crawfish crankbait is an absolute killer in the springtime so if you don't have a little red crankbait in your tackle box head down to your local shop and be sure you pick one up guys the season is here Everybody get out and get on them. From Pennsylvania, I'm George, your Pocono Outdoors guy. In last week's video forecast, I updated you on a one-way conversation I'd had with Governor Murphy, the one where he pretty much told me where to stick my dopey questions about fisheries. In fairness, the governor was just getting over about with COVID, which might have left him a little bit testy. In fact, the governor told NewJersey.com last week, quote, allow me to be your proof that the virus is still among us. So if you were wondering if there's a plague in Trenton that's threatening to destroy our state's democracy, there's your proof that virus <laughs> is still among us and will be for another three years by my account. Last week, I mentioned how Governor Murphy's office had no comment as to the missing seats on the New Jersey Marine Fisheries Council. So let's dig in on this. Last week's meeting, since the chairman, who apparently is not the most technologically savvy person on earth, does not vote on council actions as the chairman, that means there are only two legitimate, solid, exclusive sport fish representatives on the council. Pat Donnelly from Northern Ocean County and Bob Rush from Cape May County. Captain Rush voted in favor of the slot. Donnelly opposed. He was in favor of three at 17 inches and a five day increase in season. Chairman Herb didn't vote. So that's your two, your two recreational votes. Dr. Bohanek, as one general public member, there's also another one that's missing, she voted for the slot. All three commercial fin fish delegates voted for the slot. Bang, bang, bang. 
Shellfish advisors were split. Mr. Hollinger from Delaware Bay, he voted on the slot. Mr. Maxwell on the Atlantic coast voted no. Final vote 6-2 in favor of the slot. Now I mentioned before during these meetings, I'll keep notes while I'm listening in for the entire four hours. And out of the 190 people that were logged in for the hearing, about 40 or 50 individuals gave their preference. And I logged a two to one preference for the slot fish as opposed to the number two, the second place option, three fish at 17 and a half inches. It's definitely an ocean versus bay perspective. And when I look over my notes, a lot of folks wanted the shorter fish. They wanted more days of fishing. Uh, there were comments about taking pressure off the bigger females. But in the end, the council decision, whether you were in favor or not, it came down to members of the public and how many favored one option over another. Now I spent a good solid month talking about this issue, talking about this meeting, and in last week's video before the meeting, this was my advice to fellow New Jersey anglers. Listen, council will review the advisory committee's options. Advisors have their preferred options and their secondary options, but it's gonna be up to you. There are a lot of folks that really want something specific. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of polls on social media and some websites and people are trying to gin up support for what they want and trying to gather the input. But I'm telling you, if you want something particular, uh, specific with regard to black sea bass and summer flounder, you got to log in uh, to that meeting to chime in on what you want. Now, every few years I see this happen where public participation actually affects the final vote. Technologically speaking, that's two years in a row that we've seen online glitches in this public process. That, of course, is being caused, well, by the virus that's still among us. The Open Public Meetings Act, AKA the Sunshine Law, it requires that government meetings be held in public purview with the public's input. Did that happen last Thursday? That's debatable. A guy named Dennis Mackimer has a petition circular, circulating around the interweb to undo the council decision. Now, at last check, it had a little over 1,500 signatures. For comparison's sake, uh, as of March 1st, there were 24,000 registered saltwater anglers in the state of New Jersey. So that petition would probably have a little ways to go before it was gonna make any real impact. But Dennis told me this week, quote, I feel the meeting was in clear violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. Personally, I don't have a preference on the fluke options. What I'd like to see is Governor Murphy and the DEP Commissioner, Sean LaTourette, who I don't think has ever been involved, he's never been participating in one of these meetings. I would like to see these guys give one single tiny little darn about the state of fisheries management in New Jersey and the public's participation in open government. I mean, to me, the governor just sees fishermen as an unsavory obstacle in his plans to industrialize the offshore grounds for his friends from Denmark, Orsted. And Mr. La Tourette, I don't know, maybe he's following in the path of some of the other DEP, DEP commissioners that came before him. And perhaps he's auditioning for an EPA job at the federal level. I'm not being partisan, friends. I'm just pointing out a few details. A lot of smoke and mirrors, mostly just hand jive. Prove me wrong. Finally, as you're gassing up your boat this season, pay close attention to the label at the service station. The Biden administration is easing restrictions on E15 gasoline during the summer months. That's to address the high cost of gasoline. Now, that 15% ethanol blend, it's prohibited by federal law for use in boat engines, and it will void any engine warranties that you have. Ethylene and eth ethanol and gasoline, of course, is a problem for boats due to the phase separation, moisture being introduced to the onboard fuel tanks due to temperature vi variations. It binds with the ethanol and it settles as sludge at the bottom of your tank. It's also been known to be a corrosive material in fuel tanks and engine components. So pay attention at the gas pumps and look for that E15 label. One more reminder, if you're hoping to get in on that Susquehanna Flats Trophy Striped Bass Fishery that we were talking about last week, keep in mind those waters are closed to striper fishing for the month of April. No keep, no catch, no target. That's it, bottom line. The Chesapeake is closed to striper fishing right now until the end of the April spawning period. Full moon madness, however, the spawn, the spawning worms, the spawning fish this weekend. Keep an eye out. Keep, uh, keep ready for that onslaught of bluefish because it could happen at any time. 
Bass 2 out front for surf casters. I'm finding that out, especially clam baits and bunker chunks at this point. And the plugging out front should get underway pretty quickly as well. Don't wait for the reports. Go make them. Catch them up. We'll see you again next week right here at thefisherman.com.